Starting with a question. I didn't send it out? No. <laughs> what? I totally forgotten. And nobody reminded me until Bailey. Chelsea. When I walk out of this lecture, I will forget. So, you know, I'm doing really crazy things. You don't want to even know or hear about them. But, huh? What? You know, I'm really nice, but not that nice. Okay. Let's do this together as a recap to what we talked about last time. Calm down. Thank you. All right, let's do this. This is one of the questions actually in the um, problem set that is on Moodle. Yes, Katie. What? I am recording, but using, I forgot the mic, so I'm using the, this. So I will be very close to this. Um, if I remember. <laughs> okay, so this is one of the practice problems in the uh, sheet that I put up on Moodle or you, for you. Also as an extra, plus five. If you want to solve it, don't have to. It's extra credit. Okay, but let's do this together as I feel it's a very important uh, question I would like you to think about based on what we talked about last time in terms of ion exchange. When is the protein sheet? Protein sheet. Um, since you have a quiz on Monday, then how about Wednesday? Today, if you have your pH and titratable acidity and fat characterization, give it here because I will put the key online for the quiz. Okay. All right. Give it a thought. I need you to think about it. Each one of you. I might call up on you, call on you. <laughs> okay, so go ahead. Put the lab reports aside and think about the question right now, Lauren. Hi. Put the lab report and think about the question. Yeah? No, no, no. This is one of the extra credit. You can write it, write down answers, and then use it for the extra credit. Wow, look at yours. Busy person, Pam. Okay, go ahead. I need people to think. Use the time to think. What the question is asking, what we know about PI and pH above or below the PI, what happens to the charge. pH above the PI, what would be your, the charge of your protein? Negative. Good. So we have protein of interest has a PI of 4.5. It's in a mixture with two other proteins that have PI between 6 to 6.5. From just looking at PIs of these proteins, 
Would you use an anion or a cation exchange? Yeah? Anion. anion. Okay. So I want this protein to be negatively charged. Okay? My chromatography column stationary phase will be positively charged. Okay? I don't want these. What would the pH of your buffer would be? to make sure that your protein is negatively charged, interacting with the column, but you don't care for these. Could you just do the pH 95? Yes. Lucy said use the pH 5 or 5.5. At that pH, this protein would be not negatively charged. What about these two? Positive. So they will not interact with your column. They will leave with the void volume. They're just going to go with your um, mobile phase without interacting with the column. Your protein of interest will interact with the column. Good. Any questions about that? These two proteins will not interact. They remain positive at pH 5. Your Protein of interest will interact. Now what? We, did, we didn't say that. Which proteins will elute in the wash or the um, solvent front is this. These. How will you elute the protein that binds to the column? Okay, again, would you lower the pH so that it becomes you can lower the pH, but more, mostly you can do that. You lower the pH and become positive and it will no longer do that. But also you can increase the pH. If you increase the pH, what gets protonated or, or what loses the proton is the stationary phase. So your charges on the stationary phase will, will be lost because you increase the OH- minus in the buffer, then the protons on the column will be given out, and then no more the column will interact. You can do that. Another way of doing it, other than pH changes, can you salt them out? Salt them out. You increase the salt. Um, well, not necessarily salt out the protein. You increase the salt in the buffer, so the negative charges of the salt, let's say ammonium sulfate or NaCl, the Cl minus will interact with the positive charges of the column competing with your protein and the protein will it. Okay, any questions about this? You'll know how to answer something like that. Okay. So last time we were talking about separation by adsorption. And we talked about hydrophilic, in, hydrophobic interaction chromatography, ion exchange, and um, we didn't get cover affinity yet. So affinity chromatography, we talked about that in the chromatography chapter. And it's basically your protein is going to interact via very specific interactions. We'll have a very strong affinity to whatever is on your stationary phase. Interactions are going to be either uh, hydrophilic interactions, hydrogen bonding, ionic, hydrophobic, all, all sorts of interactions that are non-covalent, but very, very specific. So interactions of antibodies with an antigen or enzyme inhibitor with an enzyme um, as a very specific interaction. You can have lectins on the stationary phase and these will separate glycoproteins. And then again, how do we, once they interact, the way we have them come off the column is change the environment. If you change the environment, then you will lose that specific interactions. Changing the environment either by changing the ionic strength or pH, or having lectins, for example, in the buffer. So you will have lectins in the buffer and lectins in the column, and then 
you will have the protein interacting, leaving the lectin on the column and interacting with the lectin in the mobile phase. Okay. Moving on from separation by adsorption to separation by size. So let's say you have used salting out to salt out the protein. That means you added ammonium sulfate and you precipitated that protein because of the ammonium sulfate. You have a lot of salt with that protein now. You don't want that salt in your protein. You won't have a functional protein ingredient or functional or a protein that you can characterize later on. You want to remove the salt. Or let's say you separated by hydrophobic interaction chromatography, which also you have salt the, out the protein on the column. So there's a lot of salt that you do not want. So one thing to, to remove the salt and concentrate your protein is dialysis. Have you done or seen dialysis? Yes? No? Never? Here it is. Claire prepared this little thing for me just to show you the impact of dialysis. <laughs> Very powerful. Um, so there's a tube, and tubes, you can order them with different pore sizes. So you can have a one kilo deltan pore size, three, 10, 15, whatever. In here, what Claire prepared for me is water with, with blue dextrin. So the blue dextrin is large. And this is, I think, a 3.5 kilo deltan cutoff. So it's larger. So you can see, I put it here, the blue dextrin remains. Anything smaller than blue dextrin is going to uh, migrate out of the uh, tube. It's very cool. Do you like to touch it? Sure. <laughs> we use it a lot, especially we do a lot of hydrophobic interaction chromatography. So we do ice, remove that salt with this technique. So basically how it works is we get our protein solution that we obtained from chromatography or salting out, and we fill it, fill it in that little tube. And we put water or buffer in there, and a stirring bar. And it would stir for three to four hours. Then what happens, you will reach equilibrium. Salt inside will be equal to salt outside. But you still have salt inside. So what do you do? Huh? You have still salt inside. What do you do? You reached equilibrium. Nothing's going to go in or out anymore. Diffusion reached equilibrium. What? You can uh, remove the buffer and add new buffer. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> simply. We throw out the water and put fresh water or fresh buffer. Every, we do that five to six times until at equilibrium you have a very minute amount of salt. You are never going to remove the salt completely. You're always going to have a very minuscule amount of salt because it's based on equilibrium. Uh, memories we can purchase, you know, water can go in too. So you don't want your uh, tube to burst. You don't want the water to go in. You just want the salt to go in and out and equilibrate. So what, what usually we do is we get a polyethylene glycol covered membrane. So that will um, maintain the migration of the water or prevent the migration of the water. Separation by size can be done on a lab scale, using membranes, or in an industry scale. I'll give you the example on a, on a lab scale. Lab scale, let's say I hydrolyze the protein, and now I have protein peptides of different sizes. I want to remove large polypeptides and just keep the small peptides that I want to determine the antioxidant activity of. I care only about small peptides. So what I would do in this case, let's see if I have a, oh, yeah, they're all the same. I thought I had smaller. Uh, but what you would do, look at this one, I'll, I'll circle it. Let me circle it one more and explain it. So you have a membrane here installed with different, uh, again, particle size or pore size. So this one, for example, oh, that one is large, 30 kilo delta. But you can get a 1 kilo delta, 1,000 delta, 
from 1,000 or even 500 up to 30, 40, whatever that is. So what happens, you can separate based on the size of the protein. For example, let's say this is 10 kilo delta. Anything greater than 10 kilo, kilo delta will remain on this side of the tube where you have the membrane. We call it retentate. Everything that passes will be your permeate. And the permeate will be less than 10 kilo delta, and the retentate will be greater than 10 kilo delta. The, and the way we, we separate this, we have to apply some sort of force to, in, uh, to enforce separation. So basically, what we do, and there are different sizes of them. There could be as much as one millimeter with very, very small uh, diameter of a membrane, or they can be as large as this. So this can be put in a centrifuge, and you spin it, and you enforce the separation. So then you will have a retente, and you will have a permeate. You can apply this technique to call it a microfiltration, ultrafiltration, or nanofiltration, or reverse osmosis. And I don't know if you cover that in processing the difference, but here the, here's the difference. So you have particle size. So the smaller the particle size that will go through the membrane, so the the smaller the pore sizes, you, we call this reverse osmosis, only water will go through, water and small ions. And then um, nanofiltration, you will get to higher particle size, higher molecular weight between 100 and 1,000 deltons, and then you go from ionic to molecular. From nano to ultrafiltration, you go from molecular to macromolecule, like polymer, and it is um, from the macromolecule is 10,000 to 100. And then 100 to 500, we call this macrofiltration or microfiltration. Anything larger, it's traditional filtration, uh, like with a filter paper that will have really large pore size. Okay, so here's an example where you would do what we do in industry scale. So in an industry scale, say take the milk for example. And you want to separate the protein from fat, bacterial cells, lactose, minerals, and water. You want to concentrate the proteins. So if you start with a ma ma microfiltration, so your fat and bacteria will be the retentate that will stay on the side, the side of the membrane. And protein, lactose, minerals, water will go through. If we put another membrane there, ultrafiltration membrane, you'll have the protein as a retentate, lactose, mineral, water will go through. And then if you have nanofiltration, so you will have the lactose as a retentate, minerals, water will go through, reverse osmosis, water usually minerals as compounds or molecules will not go through. So that's how you do it. And in, in industries, of course, you need to force, right? You need some sort of forcing the penetration. So to do that, or to allow the permeates to, perme to go through the membranes, we have operating pressure. So you operate under pressure. The smaller the pore size, the higher the pressure to make sure that your particulates go through the, the membrane pores. So could you Well, it is very, it's dependent on the size, really, because it's also a pore size. So something that shouldn't go through based on size, and you put so much pressure, you're probably going to break your membrane. Okay. So, and regardless of whatever you're trying to filter, you would need to know the relative size of what you want. Yes. You have to know that at least the relative range. And usually you would do several washes. Because let's say, take the protein, they can block the pores of the membrane. So you want to introduce water and make sure that you, you have enough liquid in there to avoid blocking the pores and allowing the smaller molecule to go through. So oftentimes when you do membrane separation, there are several washes that goes with it. Even when we do it in the lab, we do it with several washes to ensure 
accurate separation. It's a very cool technique. Separation by size can be done also by chromatography as you learn size exclusion, which also known as gel filtration or gel permeation. As in. Also in proteins, you can separate them based on size because there are different sizes of protein ranging from 7 kilodalton all the way to 200 or a little bit more uh, kilodalton if they have a formed a polymer. So you can separate proteins based on their molecular weight and their structure. So if you have a denatured protein versus a non-denatured protein, they might separate differently on the column. Because a globular protein will have a certain size, and an open structure protein will have a different size. In chemical reactions, you'll see that when you run on an STS page, you run casein and whey protein, you see the casein migrate differently. Because casein is an open structure protein, whereas whey protein is a small globular structure protein. So the size excluding chromatography for protein really depends on the molecular weight as well as the structure of the protein, but can be used for separation as well. Okay. Gel electrophoresis. Have you had that anywhere? Yes? How many of you have seen? <gasps> wow. I got demonstration for nothing. No, let's see it. it. Yes. We, want to see it. Like we need a refresher. Probably. We want to see it. We've never actually cool. seen it. We just learned about it. No. Oh, well, I didn't get to see it. <laughs> okay. So this stands for polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Acrylamide. So it does have acrylamide. And acrylamide is really a carcinogen. Mm. Mm. But look what I'm going to do. I'm going to work with it without gloves. Oh, jeez, Pam. Why? I'm, am I crazy or I don't care? I'm 44. <laughs> now I recorded my age. <laughs> I have YouTube followers. <laughs> yeah, we have a record of lighting things on fire. Though, so. That's true. Oh, my gosh. I live by danger. <laughs> okay, so there are different forms of electrophoresis. The most common force, uh, form is force. Yes, the most common form is SDS page, which is sodium dedosyl sulfate electrophoresis. So what you do from the name is you mix your sample with a buffer containing SDS. So what this SDS will do, it will denature the protein, and it will, it will denature protein in a way it breaks down all non-covalent bonds. So hydrogen bond, um, um, non, well, hydrogen bond, hydrophobic bonds, and electrostatic bonds. So it will break these bonds, the protein denatures, and it will impart a negative charge on the proteins. So all the two proteins will have negative charge. And thus, when you um, load the proteins, here we go. Okay. So there is a cassette here. It's basically two pieces of plastic. Inside of it, there's a gel. The gel is prepared with acrylamide. And depending on the concentration of acrylamide, you'll have different pore sizes. So the pro you can build a gradient. You can have this one is, for example, it's Chelsea's and it's expired. So don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> it's I have lots of gels. <laughs> it's 4 to 20% acrylamide. So you have different pore sizes across the gel. So you can separate different sizes of the proteins. It's a very cool. Why is it expired? Expired? Oh, OK. It is expired because <laughs> over time, the, pro the gel hardens, and the size of the pores will change. Mm -hmm. And it won't be good for separation. Yes, sir? Is it, um, does it matter the technique? Is it, is it always accurately separating? OK, is it always accurately separated? Well, it's a qualitative technique. You'll get as much separation as is possible. But it really depends if you have 
let's say a protein that is 14 kilodalton, another protein that is 14.2 kilodalton, they will not separate very well. So the resolution is not wonderful, but you can see some separation. Okay, so where was I? So you will have different pore sizes, but all the proteins are negatively charged. So when you apply voltage, so what you'll do is you take this cassette, oh, that's a one, that's a two detail. Yeah, it's still expired. Well, and hopefully I don't have to, oh, you don't want to see the wells. You don't have that many wells. Yeah. It, well, there's one well in this there's, one. There's two wells. There's no little one. Oh, there's a little one. one. Okay. Usually you would have separate wells, so this this thing here will be like a comb. So you will have a comb-like thing, and then you will have separate wells. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. <laughs> and then you would load very carefully a few microliters, five to ten microliters of your sample in each well. And then, after you load, well, one thing you need to do, you don't do what I'm doing right now, is you have gloves on because your pro the proteins on your fingers can contaminate the gel. So you don't want to do that. So you will put your uh, gel in here, and then you'll put running buffer. You'll put the buffer, and then you close this, and we apply voltage. We have a uh, voltage unit. And what happens, a current will run through. All your proteins are negatively charged, so they go from cathode to anode. They go from negatively charged to positively charged with the current. That's the current. So all of them are going to go down. So we put SDS so that the charge is not impacting the separation. So all of them are separating purely on sites. Urea page is a different type of a gel that you use urea in the formulation. And this separates protein based on size and charge ratio. Native page, which is also a common form, you don't disturb the protein. The protein separates, you don't denature it, you don't the change its charge. The protein separates based on size, charge, and molecular. So it will just separate as is. It's not very common because sometimes proteins are very similar in certain things, so you won't be able to get good separation. So you would use either urea or SDS page, usually it's mostly SDS page, depending on the protein. Casein, for example, you need urea page because the caseins are very close in molecular weight, but they're different in charges. In order to separate them, you would use the page. Okay, so we ran the gel. Yes. So we ran the gel. Next. We break the gel. No. We break the cassette so that we can remove the gel. These are actually my hands. I've done that. My wow. Beautiful, wow. beautiful hands. Thought I recognized them. <laughs> <laughs> the gel image is mine. What? The gel image is mine. Oh, okay. Competition. <laughs> <laughs> this setup is mine. Wow. Okay, now this, this cute little thing has a, a place where you can break the cassette. Here. So listen. Listen. Oh. Broken. Okay, usually you take this off before you run anything. Okay. Then I try to gently break it without in front of Emily's face. <laughs> and usually what we do, we have a wash bottle to make sure that it doesn't break. We use water, rinse it off with water. Acrylamide. <clears throat> You're good? Thanks. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Why am I touching it? It's a film of mine. It's expired. No. Huh? Well, I'm proud of it, man. I'm not afraid. Flick it. Flick it. Flick it. Just kidding, man. Okay. So basically, 
acrylamide is uh, when it's polymerized, it's not dangerous. In powder form or liquid form, you don't want to touch it, you don't want to smell it, even especially in powder form. When I was a student, there was um, no liquid to be prepared. I had to prepare it from powder. So if you think I'm a little bit wacky, it's because of my exposure to acrylamide. And I was a graduate student. Do you want to touch it now? Yeah. It's safe. Okay. So basically, what we do is we stain the gel after that. So you use Kumasi broom stain. So the proteins will stain blue. And, and then we de-stain the gel because we don't want any, we don't want all the gel to be blue. We just want the proteins to be blue. blue. So we put them in acid and water and alcohol. Um, acid water, acidic acid, I believe, right? Or you put acid and acid and acid and water. And then you de-stain, and what you end up with is a very nice gel with your protein bands separated. So you'll be doing that in chemical reaction, looking at different proteins, different hydrolysate, how a protein mixture will have how many components, and when you hydrolyze it, you will see the different uh, components of the hydrolysis. Nobody's paying attention, nobody's looking at the chat. Okay. <laughs> what have I done? The gel fell? No, he said it broke up. Oh, okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. So basically, okay, can I have your attention? Okay, maybe I should take the gel away. Okay, moving on. Let's go ahead to, to do 2D electrophoresis. Okay, 2D electrophoresis, that means you separate a for two dimension, um, based on two dimension. First dimension is separation based on the isoelectric point of the protein. And then second dimension, you separate based on size. Because a lot of the, some proteins have sh similar isoelectric points. Some proteins have similar sizes. So to enhance resolution, we do two-dimensional separation. So isoelectric focusing, the best friend of Chelsea, um, spent probably, what, one year on it? That was in my area. OK. Getting the method to work well for her. Uh, anyway. So the way you do that, so you get an acrylamide piece of gel, and then you um, load a mixture of ampholytes. Ampholytes are small polymers that carry po both positive and negative charges. So, and then what you do is you run a current. And then those that are mostly negatively charged will, will run or will move towards the positive and those that are negatively, positively charged will move towards the negative. And then when you stop the current, you have generated a gradient of different pHs. Okay? So at each location, you have a different pH on, the, on your piece, little piece of gel. Then you load your sample. And then your sample will migrate until it hits its isoelectric point. When it hits its isoelectric point, it will stop migration. Well, pause. Okay? So then you will have your proteins that are separated based on their isoelectric point. Now, the 2D, which actually the gel that is running around, is a 2D gel, you will only have one well in that gel, the SDS page. So you take that strip and you lo load it on top of a gel that is going 420% is what Chelsea uses in terms of percent of acrylamide. Of course, you treat your strip 
and SPS buffer, right? It's a uh, yeah. DTT buffer. DTT, reducing agent, mm -hmm. and um, but it also has SPS. Yeah, there's SPS. Yeah. Definitely. So you basically the same thing. You make sure your protein is charged, negatively charged, and you add a reducing agent, especially if you have polymers in your sample. You want to break them down into monomers. And then you take that strip that you have treated with the buffer and everything, and you put it on top of the gel that will separate it based on size. So here's what you see. Look at these two proteins. They have similar size, so they migrate to the same place. Larger proteins stay, uh, stay up. They don't migrate a lot. Low molecular weight proteins migrate much more. So these two have different isoelectric points, but similar molecular weight. If I only ran as the S page, I, wouldn't, I would have seen them as one spot. Here, for example, these two have similar isoelectric point, but two different molecular weights. If I only ran the strip, I would only see them as one band. So that's the power of 2D gel. You get better resolution, better separation of a mixture of a protein. <laughs> And it has a lot of application. One would be, for example, immunoassay application, which we will talk about that in the immunoassay chapter. Keep that in mind for that chapter. OK. What, Tiffany said I'm not keeping anything in my mind? Yep. <laughs> yes, Stephanie. Well, because you want to form the gel, right? You want to form a gel with different pore sizes. There else you can yes, there are different types of, you can use different types of gels. But with acrylamide, you get better uh, consistent pore size for better separation. Yeah, you can use an agar, for example. I won't give you good, good separation. OK, capillary electrophoresis is also a very cool technique based on electrophoresis, but you can get separation and quantification like you would do in HPLC. So it's not only qualitative that you would actually see different spots of the protein, but here you actually detect them and quantify them. So as the name implies, you have a capillary tube made up of fused silica. And you in that tube, you can have either empty with buffer in it. It would be only a capillary zone. That means you don't have any gel, no acrylamide in there. You only have the silanol fr from the silica that are negatively charged. And then you have your buffer that is running through the capillary. Positive charge from the buffer will hang on to the negative charges of the silanol groups. And when you run a current, <coughs> so what happens is, your uh, positive charges will start moving towards the negative charge. So the, the positive charge attached or linked to the cyanol group will start moving and pulling proteins. And the proteins will start separating positive charge first, negative, neutral. And then you get separation, and then you get detection. Now, you can have, inside of the capillary tube, you can have a gel, an acrylamide gel, and run it under SDS. So you would prepare your sample in SDS buffer. All your samples are negatively charged. They run and separate by size. Same as with the SDS page gel, except that you are detecting them and quantitating them. Detectors here can be the same as HPLC detectors. The most common one that we have, Antonia has, is the light scattering detector. Okay, you can also have it as a capillary isoelectric focusing. So you will be separating them based in, on the isoelectric point of the protein. All right, let's think about this one.
Anybody? Sam? I see. Okay. C A so far. Sophia? A and C. A and C. <coughs> Megan? All of the above. Who wants to uh, justify their answer? We have A and C, we have A, we have C, we have all of the above. You change to all of the above? So uh, do you want to justify it then? Uh, well, all of them, well, the cation exchange in either column, you're going to have the ne your negative column, so, your negative charge column, so that will separate out the positive charges. But then since you'll have two with the same uh, positive charge, then you use the size exclusion. But considering that that's going to happen in either way, it doesn't really matter what order you do it in. Sophia can write the key to the exam. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes. And you can do precipitation by the salt because you have different charges. So if you put uh, just a little bit amount of salt that will precipitate the plus 2, you keep the plus 5 in solution. And then you can do ultrafiltration, which is also based on size. So you can separate the 90 from the 30 using, say, 50 to delta cup. Then the 30 will be your permeate, and the 90 will be your retentate. Okay? So any of these, and order doesn't matter, but usually, usually, what people do is they start by size exclusion, then cation exchange, and then salt precipitation, then ultrafiltration or size exchange. That's the norm, but this doesn't mean that it doesn't work. All right, protein nutritional quality. So to assess the nutritional quality of the protein, that's part of characterization of the protein, to determine um, how much contribution is going to do for our bodies in terms of amino acid, essential amino acid, and of course, digestibility. If the protein is not digestible, we're not going to get those amino acids in our body. So it's a combination of both. Uh, and as well as anti-nutritional factors. So if your product or, or food product has enzyme inhibitors like soy, you need to make sure they're inactivated. Otherwise, the trypsin in our digestive system will not act because you have trypsin inhibitors. Lectins, which are proteins in beans, if you eat a lot of raw uh, certain types of beans, then um, you will get those lectins, and the lectins are cause inflammation in the digestive system. So in order to determine amino acids or the composition of the protein, amino acid composition of the proteins, I have three more minutes. Let's see what I can get done here. So you would hydrolyze the protein to break all the peptide bonds. So you would wind up with a solution of amino acids. And usually, you do it with a strong acid, 6-normal HCl, and the digestion is pretty long digestion, over 24-hour digestion um, in a water bath at a controlled temperature. So you ensure hydrolysis of all the peptide bonds. And then you use ion exchange chromatography or reverse phase chromatography to separate the amino acids individually, because you want to determine the concentration of each amino acid, especially the essential amino acids. So you isolate them, you run standard, and then you get quantification um, of your each amino acid. Now, in order to quantify, as you already know from food chemistry or other places, is not all amino acids absorb light. You only have those three um, aromatic amino acids that absorb light. Like the tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine. So we cannot just measure UV absorption. We have to react each amino acid with a compound to give you a color, and then you measure absorption or fluorescence. So if you uh, measure with menhydrin, you can measure absorption at a particular visible wavelength. If you reacted with aldehyde, you can measure absorption, but you mostly you would measure fluorescence in this case. I was hoping to finish this lecture, but oh well. 
I will stop here. There's the quiz on Monday. It will include everything but those last three slides. Everything from the second exam. That's where we started. And after that, we did fat characterization and proteins. Yep. Yeah. <laughs>